We now have a very special panel for you called Preparing Youth to Thrive in an Age of Disruption, sponsored by RBC Future Launch. Please join me in welcoming Madeline Barker, Senior Director, Strategic Workforce Initiatives of RBC, who will moderate the panel this morning. Plusieurs séances d'hier ont abordé la santé mentale et la résilience. Et je sais combien de ces sujets sont importants pour nous, dans, euh, pour nous tous dans cette salle ici. Aujourd'hui se trouve être la journée belle cause pour la cause. Ainsi, lorsque vous gazouillerez, wow, à Canexis, vous pourriez inclure le mot-clic « Belle cause » pour contribuer à sensibiliser à cette cause et à amasser des fonds pour financer des initiatives en santé mentale. Encore une fois, très, très important, le mot-clic, c'est « Belle cause » en français. Nous vous présentons maintenant une table ronde très particulière intitulée « Préparer les jeunes à prospérer dans une ère de perturbation » commandité par Objectif Avenir RBC. Veuillez accueillir avec nous Madeleine Barker, directrice générale principale, initiative stratégique, effectif RBC, qui va animer la discussion. Madeleine, merci. So we're going to start with a video. In the coming decade, more than 50% of jobs will be disrupted by technology. Some will change dramatically, others will disappear completely. Replaced by new jobs that haven't even been invented yet. So how can we prepare Canadian youth today for the jobs of tomorrow? Over the past year, RBC has conducted a major labor force research study. We crisscrossed the country and talked to students, to workers, to educators, to policymakers, and employers in every sector. Our findings offer young Canadians a new map to navigating the workplace of the future. 2.4 million jobs will be added to the Canadian economy in the next four years. Human skills will be essential for nearly all of them. Skills such as critical thinking, complex problem solving, and social perceptiveness. 21st century skills too, like analytics, digital fluency, and cultural awareness. These skills empower youth to pivot between careers and across sectors. But we are not ready. In a world of work that's changing at warp speed, we need to connect a new generation. What if 100% of post-secondary students had a meaningful work-integrated learning experience? What if employers agree to hire for core skills over credentials? What if foundational skills and career planning were emphasized starting in grade school? What if together we recognize the coming skills revolution as critical to Canada's future? I was an HR professional and now I'm a software developer. I was a lawyer, now I'm an entrepreneur. I was a data collection technician, and now I'm an apprentice carpenter. I was an engineer, now I'm a regional director in healthcare services. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our fireside chat. Um, we're all familiar with the landscape. Recent grads overqualified for the jobs they can get unemployed youth who haven't been trained for the jobs that are available in their communities, young people feeling more anxious and less prepared, all under this looming threat of disruption and automation. So our topic today is preparing youth to thrive in an age of disruption. I believe disruption, change, and even automation need not be a threat if we apply our humanity, our creativity to come up with new solutions, our collaboration with all the players and challenging convention, tradition, and each other using those fabulous critical thinking skills. By doing this, we'll create a more prosperous country for all Canadians. Future Launch is RBC's 10-year commitment to the cause. You've heard me say collaboration, however, and collaboration we know will be the core of our success. Government, educators, career development practitioners, employers, business, and of course, parents and young people. We all have a responsibility to participate in making change. 
So I'm thrilled to welcome some of those collaborators to join me on the stage today for a bit of a discussion. And I'm just going to give you some brief bios as I call them up to join me. So first, Jan. Jan Basso is Assistant Vice President, Experiential Learning and Career Development at Wilfrid Laurier University. She's the past chair of the CEREC board and held leadership roles with the Canadian Association of Career Educators and Employers. Serena Hopkins, Serena, uh, Executive Director of the Canadian Career Development Foundation and Founding Executive Officer of 3CD. Serena works closely to move from ideas to action in areas of public policy, research and development, training and advocacy. Uh, Sean Thorson. Sean was named CEO of Skills Canada in 2005 as an advocate of skilled trades and technology careers in skills development for Canadian youth. Sean currently oversees the activities of the national organization, including partnership development with stakeholders from government, labor, education, and business. And finally, uh, Jo Voisin, the, the Director General of Youth and Skills Innovation, where she is the lead on complex horizontal files, including equipping youth with the skills they need to succeed in a rapidly evolving workplace. So welcome to the panel. I feel like I'm on the other side of the fire over here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so we want to have a bit of an informal discussion, but I do have a couple of questions uh, for the team. Um, and so I thought I would uh, start with a bit of a forces of change in the new world of work. Um, so our recent research report, we saw the video, um, Humans Wanted, uh, forecasted that 25% of Canadian jobs will be heavily disrupted by technology in the coming decade and 50% of jobs will need a whole new set of skills. So Joe, I'm curious to hear your perspective on what we can do to help youth prepare for the ambiguities and remain resilient when we look at the uh, sort of quantum change that's ahead of us. Yep. Great. Um, so I think the first thing I would say um, is that we need to help youth foster a love of learning because um, as much as you know, we want them to develop transferable skills, as, you know, as the RBC uh, report suggests, which I completely agree with, focus on those skills that they can transfer from one job to another, creativity, critical thinking. Uh, but they need to uh, foster a love of learning because they are going to be learning um, as they change uh, careers and change jobs. Um, so it's really about making that a career, learning. Um, the second thing I would say is um, that we need to all work together. So it's not just government uh, or education sector, it's actually business, government, education sector, individuals, and especially youth themselves. I mean, they are the future. So we need to listen to them uh, and to uh, understand what it is that they want for that future and, and how they can shape it. So I think it's very important to actually listen to what youth have to say. Um, I would also say that we need to think about including all of them. So um, if we think about inclusivity and making sure that all youth, no matter sort of what barriers they face uh, in terms of um, the workforce and, and making that transition to the workforce or um, creating their own business, um, it's important to think about how they can all participate in the labor market. Um, and that'll be key to Canada's prosperity because if we don't include everyone, um, we are risking that we will leave behind a large segment of our population. And the, th the last thing I would say is understanding resilience. So, you know, today's Mental Health Day, um, just thinking about what is it that makes one person thrive when they face a challenge and another person, you know, fall into despair. Um, so we really need to understand what makes someone resilient and how do we foster that in the future. Terrific. Yeah, go ahead. Please do. I, I really appreciate it. You're expanding the conversation beyond a, a conversation just about skills, but to be broadening that a little bit. And, and when we think about resilience, you know, I had a chance to do some research a few years back on the doing sort of a meta-analysis of the research on resilience. And what we found was that there were kind of four categories of protective factors, so factors that kind of buffer us from the, 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 the damage that can be caused by trauma and that allow us to bounce back. And, and 
So one of those four is skills. You know, for sure, the more skilled we are, the more resilient we tend to be, but there's three other categories that often aren't quite right at the top of the skills agenda that tends to be talked about in so many countries, including Canada. And so one would be more those intrapersonal factors, things like hope and belief in self, believing, being able to see yourself in the future, motivation, um, you know, feeling like you wanna get out of bed in the morning to start that day. Um, of course, it's not gonna be a surprise the other category is interpersonal. So having somebody in your life that loves you and believes that you're gonna succeed and somebody that you can call at 3 a.m. when everything's going to, to hell in a handbasket and somebody that's going to lovingly tell you to get over yourself when you need to do that. Um, and then the fourth category, and I think it's a really important one that we don't necessarily often talk about explicitly, are the systems that we live in, that we learn in, and that we work in. And to what extent do those systems, to what extent are they safe? To what extent do they support us? And to what extent do we have opportunities not just to be supported by those, those workplaces, those schools, those communities, but how, how often do we have opportunities to give back to them and feeling like we're contributing to them and making them better? So um, I love that you were broadening the conversation beyond just skills. Yeah, I think that's terrific. I, and the connection uh, in my experience between always learning or being a lifelong learner and having that toolkit of resilience are very much connected because in order to learn, you sometimes need to fail. In order to recover from failure, you need that resilience. So it's a, it's a good sort of narrative the way it ties together. Um, so uh, in an age of rapid technology disruption, no shortage of conversation about the robots are coming and the, uh, what's uh, looming ahead of us, but there's a growing emphasis on the importance of human skills. Um, and these skills sort of in complementing the power that technology brings. Um, Jan, I'm curious to get your perspective working with young people in post-secondary. What do you see as the role of educators in helping youth to build these human skills? So I think we need to do a better job, particularly at the university level. I think the colleges may be doing more in this area of ensuring that career development as an integral component of the educational experience. We need to stop thinking about the educational experience at universities as an intellectual process rooted in a, in a discipline. We need to become more partners throughout the campus, particularly in the area of career development, integrate it throughout the entire campus and the programming, both academic and co-curricular, so that we all truly are partners in the holistic education of our students. And one of the things that we can do in that area is really start talking about competencies with students so that they understand what a competency is. And I use that language as uh, comparable to foundational skills, essential skills, employability skills, soft skills. We all use different words for it, but we're all talking about the human skills that this report was all about and emphasized. And I think students are developing competencies in everything they do. They're developing them in the classroom. They're developing them in their club activities. They're developing in, in uh, their work experiences. But oftentimes they don't know they're developing them and they don't know how to articulate them. And so when we look at competencies, helping them be able to um, deconstruct the activity they've been involved in, whether it be a project in class or a work experience, and help them identify what those competencies are, that then leads to hope and confidence in their ability to be able to move forward and be adaptable in a changing environment. Um, the other thing I think we really need to do is expand our experiential learning opportunities so that students really are able to get some good quality experiential learning um, opportunities. We need to look at it as work integrated learning certainly, but as I said, there are lots of competencies and experiences that contribute to the student's growth outside of work experiences too. So thinking about leadership activities um, in campus clubs, volunteerism in the community, 
all of those types of things are really essential as well. But there needs to be an underpinning of reflection in all of them. It's not enough that students just have the experience. They need to be able to reflect on it so they can make meaning of it for themselves, so that it contributes to their self-awareness, to their skill development, to their values clarification, to their ability to explore potential careers, and also to apply the knowledge that they're developing in the classroom in a, in a uh, workplace environment. Yeah, anybody? Go ahead, Sean, yeah, please. Yeah, I think all of that is uh, is on on the mark. Uh, in addition, I think if we can start to use some common dialogue and some common terminology with young people, uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, students at the secondary level uh, around essential skills. And one of the interesting things that came out of that work was the the lack of understanding of of students at the secondary level of how what they were learning in school actually built on those essential skills and, and developed those essential skills that they were then going to use in the workforce. So if we can continue to, to reinforce, again, uh, how that curriculum transfers into job skills and link it back to the job market, uh, I think that will be very beneficial for youth. And I think we always need to remember that Whatever um, stakeholder group we're coming from, we should be thinking about the client, the student, the young people as let's try and help them develop skills. If we have a skilled workforce, that will be good for businesses, that will be good for um, educational institutions, so that will be good for government uh, in uh, you know, presumably increased uh, revenue from, from businesses that are thriving. So I think let's keep, keep those ideas at the core. So I think one of the other things that we don't do really well, particularly again at the university level, is look at graduate outcomes. So in many cases, institutions don't know where our graduates are going. So it becomes very difficult to talk to students about the wide range of opportunities that are out there for them, to give them demonstrated evidence of the fact that it's skills that are getting them, getting our graduates into jobs, and that they can stop defining themselves by their degree. Um, so if you have a graduate survey and you can show students, who, example, an English major, the breadth of, of opportunities that are open to them by virtue of the skills they have, um, it, that goes a long way. We need evidence and we need to help them explore careers, and that's really one way of doing it. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, as I coach and mentor young people, what I hear from a lot of them is uh, if they want to pivot in their career, this feeling that I've wasted, like I spent four years studying criminology and now I want to be a commercial account manager. Oh, I've wasted four years, as opposed to thinking about those four years built the skills to get you where you are. Um, so, of course, it's not a waste, but I think it's, it's a mindset shift for sure. I just couldn't let your uh, the robots are coming <laughs> comment go without making a comment about that. <laughs> I just, I really appreciate it. It was Monday morning's keynote yeah. that, w that emphasized the importance of human skills in an era of technology and how, you know, this, the robots aren't in charge, we are. Yes. <laughs> we're making decisions about how we're gonna use technology. And in fact, in an era that is really imbued with a lot of technology, human skills become all the more important because we need human skills to make decisions about what we want technology to do for us. We need human skills to make decisions, ethical decisions about the impact of technology and how technology is gonna work for us as human beings. So I just, I really appreciated that and, I, and it's emphasized in the report as well, yep. the importance of those human skills. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, Sean, uh, employers traditionally place a significant sort of focus on formal credentials as an employer. I can validate that we're on a journey ourselves as we uh, talk about this. But there's a lot of conversation about um, skills versus credentials and how that sort of impacts hiring decisions. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have a perspective on what you think needs to change for us to really push through that barrier? Well, I guess to start with, we need to think about what the definition of credentials are. Um, so that's the first piece. Uh, I think we are, uh, we're 
coming at it traditionally with the perspective that credentials are those diplomas, degrees, uh, uh, bachelor's, doctorate, those, that, that's credentials. But really credentials are uh, skills and abilities that people have acquired through experience and, and training and learning. Uh, so if we, if we look at it that way, uh, credentials are never going to go away. Uh, we obviously need credentials to uh, maintain levels of quality and, and an understanding and standards of what uh, people are, are able to, to do and how they're able to perform in specific tasks. So I think credentials are going to stay. Uh, are they going to mo be modified? Are they going to change? Are they going to adjust the job market? Uh, I think so. I think you, you're seeing uh, different groups set up their own types of training programs and uh, I think that is just the, the nature of the quickly changing job market and, and especially when we're looking at how technology is Im impacting those occupations. Uh, I think the, the key point though in all of the credential piece and I'll go, go back to the, this discussion around the human skills, uh, those are the most important skills, those foundational skills. Those are the skills that are going to allow you to transition between jobs and succeed in those areas that you want to pursue. And, and even from perspective of skilled trades, uh, skilled trades are obviously very technically focused. Uh, that's, an, that's an important element of those occupations. But the piece that we hear from, uh, for the most part, from employers of uh, where they see the, sort of the lack of skills is again around those foundational skills. Uh, the ability to communicate on the job, to work in teams, uh, you know, th th those are the skills that are, that are probably still the most challenging to kind of package and br bring to the workplace. Um, so I, I think all of that looping back to credentials, focus on those foundational skills. Credentials are always going to be there. It's just how we sort of define those credentials, I think, is, is going to change. There's an interesting connection, I think, between your comments about the definition of a credential and Jan's comments about experiential learning, because there is uh, sometimes when people say credentials, they mean completion of a learning intervention, and sometimes they mean a demonstration of a skill to a certain level. Um, and if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying if we keep it at the demonstration of a skill at a certain level, that uh, adds a validity to that credential that uh, makes skills and credentials almost interchangeable. So I just wanted to, to add um, to Sean's comment uh, about credentials versus uh, transferable skills. We all talk about transferable skills, soft skills, foundational skills. Um, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we had some kind of taxonomy where we all agreed what skills exactly we're talking about. You know, there's different things on that list. So that's sort of, you know, one uh, wish, you know, that we could sort of come out of, of this uh, thinking about. And then the other is just um, also building on Jan's comments about work integrated learning and experiential learning. Um, and thinking about active partnerships. So, I mean, I know there's lots of successful examples where post-secondary um, learning institutions are working actively with companies um, so that um, students are really gaining skills that are in demand by those employers and, and the employers themselves also better understand how the learning institution is is creating that curriculum. So there's active partnerships and I think we really need to encourage more of those. Um, you know, your video talked about, you know, 100% yeah. work integrated learning. Um, so we need to think about how would we, how would we make that happen, right? That can't just, uh, you know, can't be um, something that just government alone does. You know, we need sort of businesses and learning institutions involved in that. I would just really echo the, the value of having one skills taxonomy. <laughs> I mean, the world has kind of gone skills taxonomy crazy, I think. We, we did a literature review not long ago, and I mean, it's, it, it is endless, the number of, of taxonomies that are out there that when you really scratch the surface are saying more or less the same thing. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a common language around that? Um, the other thing that I just wanted to add on the conversation around hiring um, is the values piece. Mm -hmm. And like almost everything else, Dave Redekop, you were about 10 years ahead of me in my thinking. <laughs> I finally come to the realization really from personal experience that 
often when there isn't a good fit, it's almost never about technical skills, because you can teach those. It's sometimes about those foundational or human skills, but it's almost always about a values mismatch. You know, when the, the values of the organization and the values of the individual just don't quite work together. And so I, I, I would just want to add that to that conversation around, wouldn't it be interesting to explore um, how how organizations might be more explicit and transparent around their own values as an organization, because they, they do really vary. Not all, all organizations are the same when it comes to their values. And wouldn't it be great if we had strategies for helping young people to think through their values and to be thinking strategically about the organizations that they're considering from that lens. So thank you, Dave. <laughs> no, that makes a, excuse me, <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, one of the conversations we've been having, and I would love to get uh, your perspective, because internally within RBC we talk a lot about skills, taxonomy, and, um, and we've been talking about Apple as an example, not that they have a skills taxonomy, but as you think about young people as a, as a customer of a skills taxonomy, and I think about like when I used to go to a record store versus now when I go in to uh, you know, Apple Music, I don't actually have to know, like I don't have to learn a taxonomy, the taxonomy comes to me. And I'm curious as you think about uh, your portfolio, Joe, if you guys have had those conversations or anybody else in terms of how do we make it not a big complicated taxonomy, but actually make it a digestible, easy to use solution? <laughs> Well, you know, I work in government, so. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, ag I agree. I think one of, you know, my first comment was, like, we need to listen to youth. And, you yeah. know, what is it that they're telling us? So um, I think the first step would be, yeah, to talk to them. And I think Jan was, was talking about the fact that a lot of youth don't know how to recognize necessarily that they have skills that they've developed. Um, so, I mean, I think the first step would be to actually talk to them about how do they think about their own skills and how do they articulate those um, in something that is, um, you know, recognizable for them. Um, but, of course, you know, we can't, it, we need agreement from employers and others that those are, are the skills as well. So, I mean, I think it would involve uh, definitely a lot, of, uh, a lot of talking to a lot of people. <laughs> um, so, something that you would like to keep simple might um, eventually kind of roller coaster into something a little more complicated. But I do agree with the, the, you know, the sentiment of like, let's try to make sure that these words are recognizable and simple uh, and easy to understand for people. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So uh, World Economic Forum recently estimated that 65% of children, and I think it was children in grade one to six or kindergarten today, I can't remember the exact, but, uh, oh sorry, entering primary school today, will, be, uh, will end up in jobs that don't yet exist. Um, and so if this prediction comes true, it causes significant implications for the workforce. How do you prepare people for jobs that you don't understand or you can't forecast necessarily? Um, and I'm curious, uh, Serena, to get your perspective, perspective of others, how can we prepare young people for this uncharted water um, and build their careers? And specifically to the audience here, um, is there anything that you would uh, suggest they think about in their practice or as they're working with young people um, when they don't have all the answers to how, how they can coach and mentor and support? Well, I think the first thing I'd say is that, you know, we've been trying to predict the future forever, and it's always been pretty much an epic fail. You know, we're not very good at predicting the future, um, and I doubt that that's going to get any better as the future seems to be getting more and more complex and changeable. Um, so it probably won't come as a surprise to some people in the room that my answer to that would be, for me, in a world that is unpredictable and uncertain and changing quickly, career development is the superpower. It is, it is that, that thread that carries with you whatever's happening in the world around you. So why do I think that? I, career development, if you think about the tenets of career development, career development helps us to be self-aware, helps us to really understand who we are, what we care about, what gets us out of bed in the morning, what we're good at, and we need to know that intimately and be able to carry it with us through periods of uncertainty. 
and be able to know it so well that we can even adapt it and shift it so that we can fit ourselves into the world around us as it changes without losing who we are. So that self-awareness is critical and career development gives us that. Career development also helps us to figure out how to keep learning and to be able to name what we're learning and adapt what we're learning and apply it in different ways. Um, I don't know if um, Kim Matheson is in the room, but brilliant session yesterday about how career development is, is um, getting into post-secondary courses, right into the courses, and helping students to figure out what they're learning. So you know, they're, they're learning critical thinking in those courses, and they can take that critical thinking and apply it in all kinds of other ways. That's career development. Career development helps us to understand that crazy, messy labor market, not just through formal la labor market information, but it gives us skills and strategies to go out into our own community and get real-time information from real people about what's going on. It gives us a lens so that when we read the local paper or walk down the street and see for rent signs and construction sites, it gives us a lens to be thinking about, I wonder what opportunities that tells me about. It gives us skills and strategies to talk to people who are doing work that we might be interested in, to go and get exposure, work integrated learning and experiential learning, and to figure out what we're getting from that and how it applies to us. And finally, and really importantly, career development gives us the skills and strategies to actually navigate this labor market. Like, work search is not what it was a few years ago. The skills and strategies to get into this labor market are really different, and there's very few people out there that are teaching how to do that, but that's career development, and the skills that you need to transition once you're there, and to survive once you're there, if you're in <laughs> non-standard work, how to, how to manage unstable and uncertain sources of income, how to manage your time, Career development, in my view, is truly a superpower in today's world, in the emergent labor market. And I guess if I were to think about us as a field and what we can do, I think I'd say maybe three main things. Um, I would say that we are, in my view, more needed than we ever have been. And so the first thing that I think we need to do is raise our own bar. I think we need to take our own training and professional development seriously. I think we need to take our certifications seriously. I think we need to take evidence-based practice seriously because we are needed. And we need to be there and ready to, to give the best services that we, that we can. So that would be number one. I would say number two, um, yeah, we can't predict the future more, but we can be a voice. And, an ex and expertise and solutions. And so when we hear narratives that are harmful, we can challenge them. When we hear people saying that youth are lazy, we can challenge that. When we um, see the erosion of basic, decent employment standards, we can challenge that. And likewise, we can hold up great employers when they're, when they're trying to do their best and offering our clients decent work. And finally, I would say, we have to go ninja. I think we've got to, we've got to, there's not enough of us, so we've got to infiltrate under the radar, um, kind of in a ninja way, without being seen, <laughs> into every single classroom, so that every kid gets career development in their, in their school years, so that every post-secondary student gets career development, so that everybody, that every family that sits around a table has career conversations, so that every workplace has career development. Um, so before I retire or die, whichever happens first, I really want every Canadian to get career, quality career development. Imagine what the world would be if that happened. Yeah. I think the other thing we have to do with our youth in terms of educational programs is get to them early in their programs so they're not thinking about career development in their final year. So we need to find ways to inspire them to engage in career development from the time that they begin on our campuses. And those can be small steps, but getting them interested, helping them understand what the process is all about, um, I think that's really critical. One of the um, 
um, excellent interventions that we've been able to employ at Laurier is based on some research that was done at Memorial, which um, looks at curriculum and the kinds of competencies that are developed in the course in partnership with the faculty member and going into classes at the beginning of the semester, talking to students about the competency, what competencies are, deconstructing a particular assignment they're gonna have in that class, and then at the end of the course, going back in and helping them reflect on all of the competencies they've developed. There has been such positive reception to that from students and faculty, and a, a, a shout out to um, uh, Rob Shea and Rhonda Joy on this one because they did some excellent work and it was funded by the Counseling Foundation. If you haven't, if you're not aware of it, uh, Google Career Integrated Learning, it's a, a great strategy. The other thing I think we need to do as institutions is look at different ways of upskilling, offering, offering uh, not only our current students, but workers, ways of coming back into the system for micro-credentials, for um, um, certificates and diplomas and a laddering process that can exist so that uh, we make it ease of access, we make it portable between the different types of institutions and private sector that we have across this country. Um, and the timing works for people. So weekend formats, online formats, all of those different kinds of things so that it's much easier for people to access um, new training. Yeah, really enabling that lifelong learning that Joe talked about. Yeah. Yeah, just a quick piece to add on that we, we touched on a little bit when we had a little discussion yesterday was th that it, it really is an entire family exercise on that career development uh, and that uh, maybe we need to have how-to kits for parents of what career development discussion is about. Uh, and make sure that as parents, we understand the job market. Let's not just read the big headline. Uh, for parents, for job seekers, uh, whether they're students or they're not connected to educational institutions, make sure that we do research, that we dig a little deeper into what the potential uh, might be for careers of the future. So yeah. if, if, we, if we can prepare parents and all Canadians with that type of information and, and so they can have that, not fireside chat, but uh, you know, di dinner chat at, at the dinner table and uh, talk intelligently about here are some potential careers and potential educational pathways. I think that will help young people. Yeah, I, I love that. I think, uh, so we did a series of design thinking sessions with young people where they talked about their experiences. They're sort of making the transition from school to work and they, uh, unprompted by us drew this amazing picture with them in the middle and parents were both a positive and a negative. So recognizing the infrastructure and support and cheerleading, but also like get off my back, stop asking me what I wanna be when I grow up, like let me find my own path. And it was a really, I appreciated the juxtaposition of those two roles. And so maybe if we could get parents more on the positive and a little less on the negative, that would uh, help the journey. Yeah, Joe. So I just sort of want to jump in on this conversation, and I think you know career conversations are you know very important um, for youth with parents, but also uh, in schools, obviously. But um, I'm just thinking about that career conversation and whether it's too focused on occupations right now, mm -hmm. and you know whether we can really think about. Um, talking about those skills. So um, I thought you were going to ask us at the beginning what we wanted to be when we grew up. So I was all ready with my answer. So. Why don't you share it now? Um, so I wanted to be an animator for Walt Disney because okay. I'm, you know, I w I'm an artist, and um, this is kind of what I thought my career path was going to be. And I've ended up being a policy director in government. So. <laughs> There you go. Uh, but, you know, I think that the common thread in both of those things is really creativity, right? Yes. So um, being an artist is very creative, but also doing strategic policy can be very creative as you sort of gather all the evidence and bring together the story yeah. that creates a compelling case um, to take certain actions. So, you know, if we talk to our kids and, and in schools about um, what it is that in passions them, what, what makes yep. them get up in the morning and think that is sort of some common thread in the career that you want to pursue rather than an occupation. Agreed. Yeah, 
Yeah. And it just strikes me that I think sometimes parents get almost paralyzed with the thought that they need to have somehow have the answers and, and have some expertise. And maybe a freeing message is that, I mean, I think, I think part of that, that kids seeing parents as both a positive and a negative is, is that, you know, I, I think a freeing message is, it's much more about the questions we ask than the answers that we have as parents. And so, you know, as a parent, to ask that kid, wow, I notice that you're drawing all the time. What is it about drawing that you love? And to start exploring that, and that can start at a really early age. So I think it's, yeah, more about the questions yeah. than the answers. Terrific. Yeah, it's the whole, and it's also a talk to me versus about me, right? Sort of like that, not that sort of top-down direction. Terrific. We have two minutes. So uh, I wanted to talk about two resources for the crowd. Um, and then I think we're going to come to the end of our discussion. So thank you all so much. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us early in the morning on what is still a cold day um, to participate in the conversation. I, I hope that this is, it's not even the first, but it's one of many conversations that we'll continue to have um, about how we sort of really do work with youth to prepare them uh, to thrive in the future. So we. There was one slide, if you could go forward, yeah. So we had a booth over there at the exposition. Um, there's two uh, things if you're curious. So the first is the Humans Wanted report. You saw the video, it's available online. Um, and there's a little uh, card there with a, on your, uh, right in front of your uh, table. Um, and the second is the RBC Upskill tool, which is uh, fundamentally we took the algorithm that we used to do the research and created a digital version that allows uh, young people to sort of input their experience, their interests, and it comes up with skills-based clusters, um, but connects those to occupations. So it sort of helps to be a bit bilingual in terms of speaks occupation, because that's what many of us are talking about, but also reinforces uh, the skills component and, and bridging between unconventional, uh, perhaps, leaps uh, in occupations. So with that, um, I believe, are you coming back, Gladys? Awesome. So um, do you want us to stay up or do you want us to depart? Okay. We will wait. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you to my panelists. <laughs> so thank you very much to Madeline and all of our panelists uh, who joined us on this nice early morning. We really appreciate you getting down here um, and sharing your insights with us. Uh, a couple things that really stood out for me. I really like your comment, Serena, about maybe it's about the questions that we ask and also, you know, maybe developing our ninja-like tactics. I think we, you know, that might be a workshop next year at Conexus. Um, and uh, really like the comment about uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a common taxonomy uh, for skills because there is a lot of information out there and putting it all together uh, really makes the landscape quite complicated. And this other point about uh, how do we help young people prepare for jobs that don't exist yet, that we have no idea what it's like to work in those types of environments, how do we help prepare for that? Uh, and for me, it just leads me more to it being about navigation and agility um, and helping you navigate your way through different opportunities. So thank you all.